All right, let me, uh, let's jump in here. A couple of weeks ago, we introduced our theme for the year, which is love your neighbor. And this is based on the words of Jesus found in the book of Matthew, Matthew twenty two thirty five. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus says all of the law, all of the prophets, all of the promises, all of the do's, all of the don'ts, everything, hang, everything hangs on these two commandments. Everything we do hinges on whether or not we do these two things well. Our Christianity revolves around these two foundational commands, loving God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and loving our neighbor as ourself. I got a lot of inadequacies as a leader. And even this morning as I was praying, I was like, God, I don't know how to do everything. And our church doesn't have everything that it needs. And all of the systems aren't working. And all of the things aren't where they need to be. But one thing we're going to do well at this church is I want to lead us in loving God and loving people. If we don't get anything else right, we have to get those two things right. We're going to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we're going to love people. We may drop the ball in some other areas. But we have to do those two things well. So while loving our neighbor is our theme for the year, as I said last week, we can't start there. We can't bypass number one, which is love God. We can't effectively, properly, and biblically love people, love our neighbor, if we don't first love God. So the first week I encouraged us all to do some soul searching. Do we really love God? And if we say we do, what evidence is there of that in our lives? It's not enough to simply say, I love you. It's not enough to just simply come to church on Sundays. Those things may, but they also may not be an indicator of love. I've used my relationship with Katie several times over the past few weeks as an example. But how many of you know it's not good enough for me to simply say, I love you? If my actions do not align with my words, there's a problem. If I visited her once a week for two hours, sang her a song, gave her a kiss and said goodbye until next week, how many of you know that that would not be a true indicator of love? She expects my full and true devotion and I expect that from her. Why would I treat my relationship with God less than, I would, than the way I would treat my relationship with my spouse? Last week we talked about loving God by denying ourselves. The Apostle Paul said it this way in an ancient letter to first century Christ followers in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so last week we said that one of the best ways to crucify our flesh or our worldly desires, quote unquote, is by fasting. Because fasting disconnects us from the world and prayer connects us to God. And we briefly looked at a couple of passages from the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, Jesus said, when you fast. He didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. The implication is there is an assumption that you will fast. And for much of my adult life, I've treated fasting as optional, never considering the fact that the words of Jesus imply assumption. Again, not if, but when. We need to incorporate fasting and prayer as a regular spiritual discipline. And we also look briefly at an encounter that the disciples had with a demon-possessed boy. And when they could not cast out the demon, they asked Jesus why. He looked and his response says that they were faithless and perverse. First, they were faithless, as in not connected to God as their singular power source. And secondly, they, he used the word perverse. That word actually means corrupted, as in they had too much of the world in them. And maybe you can relate to that as I can. Often faithless and too much of the world in my life. And so Jesus gives a twofold answer to their question. The response to being faithless or full of unbelief and perverse or corrupted as in having too much of the world in them was prayer and fasting. Because again, prayer connects us to God. And when we're connected to God, our faith is increased. And fasting disconnects us from the world and its temptations. When we disconnect from the world, it's easier to connect to God. So prayer connects us to God. Fasting disconnects us from the world. If you missed last week or have questions about fasting, I'd encourage you to go back to last week's message on YouTube or the podcast. 
So where does that leave us? Matthew 22, 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now, we also briefly talked about how we are made up of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. You are a spirit. That's the real you. That's the part of us that becomes a new creation when we surrender our lives to Christ. We are a spirit. We have a soul. Biblically speaking, our soul is our mind, will, and emotions. That's the part of us. That part of us does not become a new creation when we come to Jesus. Our minds have to be transformed, as Paul put it in the book of Romans. We spent several weeks I mean, we spent weeks and weeks talking about this a couple of years ago when we talked about renewing our mind. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word renew actually literally means renovation or a complete change for the better. So our spirit becomes new instantaneously. But in order for us to experience the life that God has intended for us, we must be we must transform we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We have to renovate the way that we think. But that doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen accidentally. It only happens intentionally. And some of you that came forward today, whether it was, you know, specifically for addiction or something like that, you know, if you've surrendered your life to Christ, your spirit, man, became new. You're, you're a new creation in Christ, right? You're on your way to heaven, but you're going to have to fight a battle when you leave because your mind has to be renewed in order to sustain the victory that God gives you in a moment like this. Amen. All right, so we are a spirit. We have a soul. We live in a body. Jesus says, Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Now, for those who don't know, I'll give you a little history here on the Bible, and I'm not an expert on this, but the Bible isn't just a book. It's a collection of 66 books written over a period of 1,500 plus years. Our English versions of the Bible have been translated from original manuscripts that have been found throughout history. Our English New Testament, for example, has been translated mostly from Greek manuscripts. But for perspective and validity, there are over 25,000 handwritten manuscripts that date all the way back to the second century for the New Testament alone. All right, just, that was just a little fun fact for you. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. In Mark 12, 30, he says it this way when questioned about the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Now, the word heart is translated from the Greek word cardia. The meaning is described, of course, as the muscle that brings life, as in our actual physical heart, but it's also described as the seat of our emotions, which is what we were talking about in regards to our English word soul. The bibl in biblical times, see, the soul is the seat of our emotions, but in biblical times, the bowels were considered the seat of your emotions. How many of you are thankful that it doesn't say, love the Lord your God with all of your bowels? So love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your emotions. Then he says, love him with all of your soul. Now, this word soul is translated from the Greek word suke, and it means this, the breath of life. He's telling us to love God with all of our life, all of our breath. And then he says, all of your mind and your strength. And these are pretty, so those are pretty self-explanatory. So Jesus leaves no stone unturned. Love God with your emotions. Love God with your breath, your spirit, your life. Love God with your mind and with your strength. Everything we are is to love God. When we're angry, when we're sad, all of our emotions, when we're joyful, when we're afraid, when we're frustrated, when we're happy, love God with our life, with our breath, with our spirit, with our words, with our song, with our prayers, love God. With our thoughts, with our worries, with our reflections, our ideas, our opinions, our meditations, we are to love God with all of our strength, with all of our energy, with our jobs, with our careers, with our vocations. We're to love God with every part of ourselves. The command is to love God with all that we are, spirit, soul, and body. Now, last week I incorrectly said, quote, our Christianity revolves around these two foundational principles. These are not principles. These are commands from God himself, part of the original top 10. And part of the problem is that we have a lot of the markings of Christianity, or we've marked things to look like Christianity, but we have drastically revised the perimeters. Now, if you've been around a while, you know that my family and I, we are college basketball people. We are from Kentucky and basketball is life. 
And all of you Florida and Georgia folk aren't even aware that you have a basketball team. <laughs> That's how it was in Kentucky for years and years regarding football. Uh, until recently when we started beating Florida in football every year, which was an exciting time for us. It's really not that big a deal because everybody beats Florida every year lately. So. Oh. <laughs> All right, back to basketball. Imagine that I'm outside and I take our little tykes basketball hoop that I bought for Bennett when he was one. And I mark the out of bounds line and I mark the free throw line, but I mark it three feet away from this hoop that really only extends to about four feet tall. And so I'm standing at the free throw line, which is three feet away from a four foot basketball goal. And I'm on a roll. I've hit 439 free throws in a row. I'm so good and it's so effortless that I haven't even worked up a sweat. And Katie comes outside and she says, what are you doing? And I say, I'm playing basketball. I've just hit 439 free throws in a row. On a scale of one to 10, how impressed do you think she is? She's like, you're an idiot. I can assure you she's not impressed at all. Why? Because the rim of a basketball goal is supposed to be 10 feet high and not four feet high. And the free throw line is supposed to be 15 feet away, not three feet away. In my mind, I might have been playing basketball. I might have even convinced myself that I'm good, that the free throw, that my free throw percentage is better than some NBA players. But the reality is that's not how the game is played. And the sad truth is that's how we often do Christianity in America. We've revised the parameters to fit our needs. We've lowered the standard in vain to try to appease the masses or make ourselves feel better. In some cases, our Christianity is so different that it no longer resembles the original. Loving God with our whole heart, soul, and mind and strength isn't optional. It's the number one foundational command given to us from the creator of the universe. Now, a while back, Pastor David sent me an article from the Babylon Bee. Anybody familiar with the Babylon Bee? If you're not familiar with the Babylon Bee, it's essentially a satire website uh, basically from a Christian perspective. And they write about everything from politics to Christianity to gym memberships. Here's what it said. Times are tough here in the United States, especially for Christians. From subpar coffee quality and stale breakfast pastries to the worship team's fog machine breaking down and congregants having to park up to 100 feet away from the church building. American churches are facing unprecedented hardships but how are our Christian brothers and sisters around the world faring? The Babylon Bee has conducted an investigation and came up with the following list of differences between the challenges faced by the underground church and the American church. The American church, complex growth and marketing strategies. The underground church, growth strategy is preach the gospel and try not to die. American church. Pastor jumps on dirt bike over the stage to attract a crowd. <laughs> Underground church. Pastor rides dirt bike to escape the secret police. American church. Pastor has thousands of followers on Instagram. Underground church. Pastor is forced to hide his identity to avoid being placed in a concentration camp. American church. Eight trained musicians play over a $12 million sound system. Underground. Acapella hymns whispered to avoid detection. American church, bummer, your favorite preacher from the pastoral staff isn't speaking today. Underground church, bummer, the only pastor your church has was in prison last night. American church, greeters stand by the doors. Underground, lookouts posted on the roof. American, pastor hides money in the walls. Underground, pastor hides in the walls. American, search for a new church because the music isn't your style. Underground, search for a new church because yours was born down, burned down by warlords last week. And then it says, not satire. Picture this, Afghan Christians hiding in safe houses. North Koreans escaping the brutal regime. Christian families attacked by Islam, Islamist mobs. Christian girls at risk of kidnapping and forced conversions. This is the real life. This is real life for many Christians today. They risk their lives for believing in Jesus. Now, I realize that articles like this can really play on our emotions. It's very difficult for us to wrap our minds around 
what others are experiencing, especially in the underground church or in difficult countries, places where there's pressure and persecution. Most of us don't have a reference point for that. And I'm not trying to say that the way that, the, the, the way that we have church in America is wrong. The reality is our format here is similar to a higher percentage of churches. The problem with American Christianity is not the format, it's our heart. I recently read of a minister who had two families leave his church because the parking lot attendants didn't direct the cars out of the lot fast enough. The issue isn't the length of time that it takes. The issue is our appetite. We've lost our appetite for more of God. And we talked about that last year. The reason many of us are no longer being filled by the spirit of God is because we're too full of other things. This quote from D.L. Moody absolutely rocked my world last year. He says this, quote, I firmly believe that the moment our hearts are emptied of selfishness and ambition and self-seeking into everything that is contrary to God's law, the Holy Spirit will come and fill every corner of our hearts. But if we are full of pride and conceit, ambition and self-seeking, pleasure and the world, there is no room for the Spirit of God. I also believe that many a man is praying to God to fill him when he is already full with something else. Before we pray that God would fill us, I believe we ought to pray that he would empty us. There must be an emptying before there can be a filling. And when the heart is turned upside down and everything that is contrary to God is turned out, then the spirit of God will come. That brings us back to fasting. Fasting disconnects us and empties us of the other things so that we can more easily connect with God. Several months ago, God began to break my heart in a new and a fresh way. Many of you that have been here for a while will remember I would just get up here and cry and say things like, do whatever you want, I'll be at the altar. And I would just weep. I don't even know what was going on because I wasn't looking and I'm still on the journey and I haven't arrived nor do I think that I ever will. But there's a new and a fresh hunger to encounter God in ways that I've only read about. I remember the Sunday not too long ago when there was an impromptu call to pray similar to what we had this morning. It was a, a call to pray and seek God and people flooded the altar to pray. And after the service, there were literal puddles of tears from people crying out to God. And it feels like we're entering into a season of separation. There will be those that want to go deeper and there will be those that do not. And I know I've said this many times before, but I'm not interested in doing church, quote unquote, as usual. I'm not talking about the format. I'm not talking about the worship style or lights or fog or any of the things. I'm talking about the position of our heart that's open to whatever he wants us to do. I think about my kids. Jim Simbola, in one of his books, had this to say about our children, quote, what will our children and grandchildren grow up experiencing in the church? Extended times of worship and waiting on the Lord will be, totally, will be a totally forgotten experience. There will be no memory bank of seeing people reach out to God. All they will recall are professionally polished, closely timed productions. God help us. Listen to the words of Jesus from the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter two, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. Consider how you have fallen, repent and do the things that you did at first. Listen to me, I'm so grateful for what God is doing in our midst. I'm so grateful for this amazing facility and how God provided a way for us to completely renovate it. This place is awesome. It looks awesome. The sound is awesome. And we're still not finished. There are more improvements that are coming. This place looks cool. I think the pastor's pretty cool. He definitely has a pretty cool wife. I'm not interested in being the cool church. I don't want to just be the new kid on the block that has a new cool toy that everyone comes to see and everyone comes to play with. Everyday church has got to be a church that first and foremost loves God and from that love for God will flow our ability to love our neighbor. 
There are people in this room who have allowed their love for God to wane. Many of us, like the church addressed in the book of Revelation, have forgotten our first love. And the invitation this morning is to do exactly what Jesus said, to repent and do the things that you did at first. I know we've already had our prayer team up here. You guys are getting extra work. Will you guys join me once again? I know we just had an extended prayer time. And maybe you got everything out that you needed to get out. As we close and Adrian plays, I want us to take a moment, whether it's at your seat, at this altar, or praying with somebody, to be introspective in our hearts, to reflect about what God is doing in your own life. God, forgive me for not loving you well and I know that when I'm not loving him well I'm certainly not loving my neighbor well I'm asking every person under the sound of my voice to have a moment of contemplation before you leave this room and if your relationship with God isn't where it needs to be or where it used to be again I already said this earlier don't leave this place without making it right look I know this isn't a real polished close but that's it. That's how we're going to close. I want to invite every person in this room to have a moment of contemplation. Maybe you want to kneel at your seat. Maybe you want to kneel down here and pretend there's an altar. There is one coming, a place to kneel and pray. Eventually there will be one here. Maybe you want to sit there quietly. Maybe you just want to bow your head. Maybe you're like, I've got to get out of here. I need to go. Whatever the case is, I'm asking us to have a moment of contemplation between you and and the Lord and ask him if you love him you probably already know the answer to that but there may be areas in your life where you can say God do I really love you and then let the conviction of the Holy Spirit rise up inside of you don't resist it when you're like you know what there's this area of my life when God highlights something or he shines a light on a dark spot that's not just so you can be like, oh yeah, that's, uh, that's cool. It's so that you can release that to him. So as Adrian plays, I want to invite you to find a place. Again, you don't have to move at all. I don't know what you're going to do. Again, that's between you and the Lord. I'm just asking you to contemplate where your life is, where your heart is. And if you'd like somebody to pray with you, our team is here at the front. On behalf of Pastor Randy and the entire staff at Everyday Church, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. For more information on the church, please visit us at everydaychurch.xyz.